Oh, I think I'm live. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Okay, gotta test some things. Is my microphone okay? Because last time I, ex I accidentally used my um, um, webcam microphone. Hello, people. Welcome. <laughs> I guess that's a yes, judging by all the highs and hellos. <laughs> Welcome. Um, let me switch over to my PowerPoint. Wait, no, I'm going to talk about the Godot Jam. Go Godot Jam first. <laughs> we got you covered, Lissy. Well, welcome everyone. It's a bunch of people. Okay, so this is another live stream for the Go Godot Jam. And I have some cool things to show you. There is for the gold and diamond tiers, um, a front row seat for uh, asking questions to the Godot developers. Adrian is going to do an interview with the, with Remy and Juan. It should be somewhere in here. You can actually ask questions to the Godot developers, which is really cool. Also, there is a discount code somewhere for the, oh yes, the theme, energy source. Mm -hmm. There is a discount code for the t-shirts, but I forgot what the discount code was. Let me look that up real quick. Um, I will get back to you that to you on that later, or maybe Adrian is in the chat and he can show the, um, the discount code for the t-shirts. I am looking at the wrong chat. Here the chat is. Okay. So what else do I have to promote for the Go Godot Jam? Um, Oh yes, if you finish your game and upload an HTML build to, to gotham.io, um, actually one or it was five even, five dollars will be do donated to the prize pool and the Godot fund, basically to the, the Go Godot Jam by gotham.io. But you will also, have, you can also embed that gotham.io game into itch.io. You need to have it on itch.io to make um, to be eligible for prizes and for the voting. Do you really use Google? Firefox is better. Google Google is a search engine. Firefox is a browser. I actually made a PowerPoint. <laughs> so. 3D mesh generation in Godot. Well, fasten your seat belts. <laughs> Let's go. In this presentation, I have a well, live stream, <laughs> um, which is basically a presentation now. I have a bunch of things that I want to show you. So what you'll hopefully understand by the end of this live stream. Um, we will first cover basics of a 3D mesh. Like what is a 3D mesh? We'll have a look at vertices, edges, faces, and triangles. Oh yes, the GoGoDo t-shirt discount code is in the chat. So check that out. We will also have a look at indices. So those vertices, edges, and faces and triangles it's probably something you're familiar with if you are a um, 3D modeler using Blender, but indices is something you might not have might not have come across in Blender. We'll cover that. <laughs> we'll also talk about vertex normals, what they are, and the vertex properties, like vertex colors and UV coordinates. And then we'll talk about the five different ways of creating meshes within Godot, because there are a bunch of different ways you can create meshes. 
and then mesh generation with two exclamation marks, we're actually going to be creating some meshes using code. So let's get started. What is a mesh? Indices, now indices is um, plural for index, but we'll cover that in a moment. So what is a mesh? A mesh is an object containing consisting out of triangles or lines consisting out of vertices, which are points. Let me draw this out. Oh, wait, I have, yes, text. So <laughs> I have a pen. So a vertice, a vertex, Matt is going to <laughs> be very angry, angry if I call a vertice, one vertice, <laughs> and an indices of if I mess up my plural. Are you going to do this with high tech math? No, this is actually quite simple, but I need to concentrate. Um, I have a mug and there's actual Red Bull in there. <laughs> okay, um, let's go. Vertices. Vertices are points in space, 2D or 3D, like these ones. And you have one big list of vertices. So this is number zero. I'm trying to draw this with a mouse. This is going to go uh, terribly wrong, but this is index zero. This is one, or well, vertex uh, zero, one, and two. So those are the vertices you have for a basic triangle. A lot of people think uh, if you have a mesh that it has to be 3D, but no, 2D meshes are also just a triangle like this. Then edges, this is an edge that connects uh, vertices. Faces often refers to a face on a 3D object. And in this case, we can just call it a triangle, which is this part right here. Just the, the thing in the middle that is connected and closed off. Okay, so now we have the basics. Let's move on. What are indices? In here I said one, two, three. I am going to change that right now because that is incorrect. This needs to be zero one and two. Okay. Um, so we have these vertices, which is zero, one, and two. Indices is the order that the mesh and vertices are connected to each other. So in Godot and most graphical applications that like OpenGL, you work with a clockwise winding order, which is this way. So we start at zero, one, and two. And these are in the, the indices. So connect vertex uh, zero with one, connect one with two and connect two um, Oh yeah, this is the order. Am I messing something up? No, I'm not. This is a triangle. One, two, and three. One, two, three. And these will be connected in groups of three. I also need to read the chat. Meanwhile. The blue deer is a wild spirit that nobody can tame. That no one can tame. Um, Someone is trying to tame the blue deer. That is... No, you can't. <laughs> okay, so indices is how you connect the vertices together. Then, if we want to create a square instead of a triangle, you will need two triangles, actually. Because every mesh is consisting out of multiple triangles and um, Usually when you're modeling inside of Blender, you work with quads, which are made out of one, two, three, four points. But actually, if 
we, for example, raise this one, you will see that there actually should be a line here because the, the, the face is folded like this. You can basically make any shape that you want out of triangles. But for humans, it's just so much easier to model with, uh, with squares. But in the game engine, uh, usually, well, always, the, the mesh automatically gets triangulated. So if we want to draw a quad, we have these vertices. And we have 0, 1, 2, and 3. That is a beautiful 3, thank you. Um, what we then want to do is connect them together. So what we have is we want to connect the first triangle from 0 uh, to 1, and then from 1 to 3, and then from 3 to 0. But for the second triangle, we actually want to connect them to existing um, points so that we don't have six vertices, but we can use four and they will be connected together. So the second triangle will have indices of one, two, three, and then we'll go back to one. So that's how, how you draw um, a quad shape. Does the order that the indices connect affect anything? Yes, it's very important to always do this in uh, clockwise winding order. Otherwise, the face might get flipped or you connect the vertices together wrongly. Wrongly, if that's even a word. <laughs> in a moment, you will see what will happen. Um, Oh, um, according to this PowerPoint, I will read the chat, but I'm already mostly doing that. I mean, in the meanwhile, let me check if everything is okay on YouTube. 23 people watching. Yes, seems to be doing okay. Um, I think that's good enough. Let's move on. So do people <laughs> okay, wait, wait, before we move on, are there any questions about indices or vertices or anything else that we've talked about so far? It's a similar approach to drawing in 2D, I think, just that you're adding a third axis. Yeah, basically, if you... 2D meshes can be easily turned into 3D meshes because there they just have a third axis in, indeed. <laughs> I think, I don't know about the delay, but... Meta, no. <laughs> okay, um, let's move on. The five different ways of creating meshes within Godot. There are five, five different ways. Why? Let me explain. But I might not really understand why either. Because for... Take another sip of the Red Bull. <laughs> Where is my mouse? These four are very similar. In particular, uh, these two do basically the same, but one is faster than the other. We'll have a look at that in a moment. Uh, this one is just complete, something completely different, but they um, provide you tools to create meshes within the editor, but not needing code. Let's move on to the first one, which is the mesh data tool. So the mesh data tool lets you edit existing meshes. Um, you will need to, you, to use this, you will want to use this class when you want to modify an existing mesh and you need data 
um, you need access to the edge or face data. Usually with the other classes, you can't access these features, but if you don't need those features, it's better off using those other classes I will talk about in a moment. For example, I have a really janky example over here. Um, <laughs> I was trying to get a, to, to to make an example work, but I didn't really have time. CSG counts as mesh generation, um, maybe. <laughs> I just wanted to include it because it involves creating meshes within Godot without having to create a mesh outside of Godot. But in, in this case, I've actually um, used Suzanne, the, the Blender monkey. And I, um, I did something with it, but it didn't really work out. But yeah, this is an example of what you can do with it. You can actually grab uh, you can grab all the vertices, you can get the face count, and then you can grab face vertices. But let's not dive into the code too deep for now, because we will do that in a moment. Between array mesh and surface tool, which is better? We will get to that in a moment. Okay, so let's move on in the PowerPoint. So, Mesh Data Tool, you will want to use it when you need edge or face da data when you're going to manipulate an existing array mesh. An array mesh is just a mesh that you throw inside of a mesh, insta mesh instance. If you drag an .obj file, for example, in here, you can see it has those little three dots and a plus which is, according to this, an array mesh. And you can access everything about that mesh. Using the mesh data tool, you can ac access those extra features of edge and face data. Okay, I lost my mouse again. Where is it? There it is. Okay. Then, immediate geometry, which is another one, is a class that is really easy. Out of all, all of the other classes, this one is the easiest to use and requires very little code to make a small mesh. But the downside of this is that it's very slow. And it is mostly, the, well, the best use case for this is when you want to really quickly throw together uh, debug shapes for in your Godot game. For example, if you have a, a physics character or just a character in general, and you want to draw a line for a ray cast, or you want to draw a line for, uh, for example, the velocity, or if you're making a 3D car game and you have, want to draw the velocity and the steering in which you're going with a, a 2D, well, a 3D line in 3D space. Then this class is useful, but it's slow and it's really not recommended to use this in your um, in your finished product. And one thing, it's a node. So it's really easy to just... Do I have an example? Um, well, here I have an example. Hello, welcome. <laughs> um, Immediate geometry is one node that you can just add to the scene. And on that, you can add, you can call all those functions. We are going to quickly glance over what the code for that looks like, if I can even find the window in all this mess. <laughs> Where is it? Here. Immediate geometry. This is all the code that you need for creating a debug line. So what happens is it extends uh, immediate geometry because when you add uh, code to that node, you will want to use that class. And then in the process function, you first clear the entire mesh. 
Otherwise, it will this by the way. This code will run every frame in the process function, but it will need to run every frame. Otherwise, it gets deleted. But first, you need to clear the mesh from the last frame. Then you will start, and you want to create a mesh consisting out of triangles, which is mesh.primitive triangles. Then you will set a normal. We will go over that in a moment, and I kind of forgot to set up an example for that, but I will try to explain what vertex normals are. Then setting up the UV. Oh, apparently you don't have to do this if you're just going to draw a line. But this draws a triangle, I think, because it has one, uh, one, two, and three vertices. So we said the ver vertex normal, the, ver the UV coordinates, and the ver uh, vertices. So one, two, three, you create them, three points, and in this order that you create them, they will be connected. You don't have to provide the indices. And then you will just say and, and this will draw a tri triangle. It's easy, it's quick, but it's only useful really for uh, debug shapes when testing your game. That was immediate geometry. The second one, I think. Then surface tool. Okay, let me also read the chat. <laughs> there don't seem to be a lot of questions. If you have any questions, just or if it's going too fast, just yell at me in chat. And okay, mm. surface tool. Surface tool is quite easy compared to the others. This is more difficult, but it's easy to use, um, and it has a bunch of useful functions that you can use on the geometry, which we'll also go over later. Then, um, lastly, well, not lastly, of the four, these are all that have to do with mesh generation and mesh manipulation through code. The last one of these is the array mesh, which we are going to be having a look at with the code, and which is the more difficult one, or well, the most difficult one of all the others, but it is the fastest. And the downside is that it has a couple of less, a couple, well, it doesn't have a lot compared to the surface tool. It doesn't have all the useful functions for recalculating vertex normals, for example. We haven't talked about vertex normals yet, but bear with me. <laughs> mm. So for if you want to create a mesh in your game, a big mesh that is not for debug purposes, you will want to use surface tool because this is just easier to use and has useful functions. Or you want to use array mesh because it is a little bit more difficult to use, but it's faster. And we are going to be having a look at array mesh because it is in general just, if you understand this one, you will understand all the others. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, people. Please say so. <laughs> Please say so if I go too fast. I blame the Red Bull in my bug. Okay, the array mesh. And then I read the chat, which I already did. Manon is asking how I am doing today. I am... I am okay, I guess. I hope everyone is still following along. I have read the chat. Let's continue. <laughs> CSG, Compute Solid Geometry, is for creating meshes within the editor without having to use code. Um, as it says, in editor mesh editing, and is useful for prototyping levels and creating quick test geometry. 
And good to know, it's, it's not very fast. So if you want to create it in an entire level or gray box an entire level using this, it's not very fast. So in the end, you will want to replace it with something. PowerPoint. <laughs> understand this then all the others will be easy does that mean others are similar yes except the csg um, mesh data tool um, surface tool immediate geometry and array mesh are pretty much the same the only difference between them is uh, how you use them the notation but once you understand array mesh it's it's really the all the others will make sense <laughs> With uh, compute solid geometry, you can do Boolean operations, which I'm going to show right now. Swoop, swoop. Um, right here, I have a spatial and a CSG combiner. A CSG combiner is basically an empty CSG node. All the, if you search for a CSG, these are all the different um, shapes available to you. And this CSG combiner, which is, like I said, basically an empty one. And what I did here is on the CSG combiner, you don't necessarily need the CSG combiner, I think. I've added uh, this thing, a cylinder and a CSG sphere. What they can then can do, if I select the sphere, I can set it to in the operation to subtract. If I, am I doing this right? Why is it not doing the thing? Oh, this is not supposed to happen. I think. <laughs> I can, I move the mesh, but the mesh itself doesn't move. That's so weird. Let me get rid of the, it's, it's gone, but it's still there. <laughs> okay. That is not how it's supposed to go. Is there something that you can absolutely not do with array mesh that the others can do? Or is array mesh like the ultimate? No, actually um, the surface tool can do things that array mesh cannot. But the main reason you would will want to use that is performance. If you want to make a Minecraft clone and you really need the performance, it's just best to go with C sharp and array mesh because fast language and the fastest um, cr um, shape creation class. You said the sphere as a child of the cube. Um, this used to work before. <laughs> um, I think a bunch of things are broken. Let's just retry the entire thing. I have a CSG and combiner. Cylinder. Yes, now it's working. And then we add a sphere. We move that over. We scale it down a bit, move it up. Let's increase the radial segments and the rings to make it nice and smooth. Let's do the same for this one. And now we can move it around. Here in the operation, we can do Boolean operations like um, intersect. This will save the space that is intersecting between both shapes. And with subtract, we can remove the cylinder from the other shape. Which looks pretty cool, to be honest. We scale it up. As you can see, it's not great, but it gets the job done if you want to create simple uh, geometry for your levels. 
or just test geometry in general. <laughs> okay, that's a CSG, which doesn't have a lot to... Hey, Herrick, welcome. <laughs> um. Let's move on to actual mesh generation via code. Oh, according to this small kitten eating a waffle, it is time to try out the code. Let's move this over. And let's go. Where do I have? Oh, I just closed the presentation. <laughs> I love that image so much. Okay, we have an empty project right here. Let's get to, to the good part. Let's create a 3D scene, a spatial, and to that, let's create a mesh instance, which is a node that holds meshes. Then in the mesh property, we will need to select an array mesh. And that's all we have to do for that. Let's create a new script and let's call it uh, the, the cool match or whatever. Let's just save it here. Let's hit create. And let me look up the code that I saved beforehand. Okay. So now we have a script that derives from mesh instance. We will want to create a, th let's just create a triangle first. So what we want to do is we want to create one big array that is going to er hold multiple arrays, which might sound confusing, but basically see an array mesh as um, a thing that holds multiple arrays which is the mesh array, which holds the list for vertices, the list for um, vertex normals. I should really explain vertex normals. Uh, the list for UV coordinates and list for indices. Let's have a look at vertex normals real quick. Vertex normals are basically where this, no this vertex points towards. We can visualize that in Blender by going in this little menu and then visualizing um, display vertex normals. As you can see, each ah, voice cracks. Each vertex has a direction that it points to. And what can happen is that you can't see your mesh because can we uh, flip flip the normals? Oh, it takes the, um, uh, what is it called? The average. So it moves a slight bit. But it's basically in which the normal direction, um, in which direction the single vertex faces, which might sound confusing, but it is useful for when you want to shade the mesh smooth. Oh, wait, we can also visualize that in display split normals. I'm not entirely sure how these works work because if we, now it's smooth shaded because it uses the average of all those uh, of vertices to draw that line. Like in this angle, you have it like this and the average outwards is in the center. But if we done Shade in shaded flat, you'll see that these will be split up into multiple directions. So when when you have one face, all the vertices point one way uh, in the direction of the face, and this will cause the lighting to be um, shaded flat. Let me also read the chat. Yeah. 
If we create a mesh using a particular method, is there a way of exporting or transferring it over to one of the other mesh systems in Godot? Do you mean, do you mean um, switching between array mesh and um, uh, surface tool? Because there is no real reason to do that. What you can do is use the mesh data tool. So the mesh data tool was for um, for grabbing faces and particular edges. You can do that actually with the array mesh and immediately after that, editing it with the mesh data tool. For rendering, you could say that the normal is the direction in which the light will be reflected. Yes, that, exactly. And it's also how normal maps work because those pixels will define in which way the light will bounce off. <laughs> so, does each vert only have one normal, or does one normal for each face that it's part of? That is one part I don't really understand yet. Because in Blender, what we just saw is that it seems to be having multiple um, normals poking out from it. But if we select it, it's only one normal or one vertex, which might be a little bit confusing. But let's just skip that for now. <laughs> I'm curious if someone knows how that works. Because it's one vertex, but it seems to be having four vertex normals. So we have one big array that contains multiple arrays. Now let's define those arrays, which we'll be doing using this. We will have uh, an array for the colors, which we'll see in a moment. <laughs> vertexes, vertices can have colors and then have we have a list of the vertices which is very important and the other one that's also really important is the mesh indices okay let's then uh, the function ready Yeah, it's based, each face has separate vertex normals based on smoothing. Yes. Split normal is one normal for every face. Can you edit, create edit face normals in Godot? I am not sure about that. Because when you have those arrays, you have vertex one, two and three, for example, or zero, one and two. And it looks in the same, in the other array of the vertex normals, it will um, index zero. The first vertex will correspond to the first vertex normal. The second one will correspond to the second vertex normal. We have normal one, one normal per face, multiple different directions facing per vertex. And a hard edge. Yes. Okay, but what we have to do is now resize the mesh array to this. And we'll have a look at uh, mesh.array max. Mesh array max is nine. And these are all the lists that we can put into it. We have an array of vertices, an array of normals, array of tangents, which is a little bit too difficult to explain right now, a list of colors, a list of UVs, a list of UV2, which in which I think the um, uh, light map data can be stored. 
You can also have bones and weights. You can actually create a 3D model with bones using Godot, which is really cool. Good luck with stream. Thank you. <laughs> and array max is just how many uh, arrays you want in there. But you stun it. Usually you just resize it with um, the max. So nine arrays can fit in through there. And then what we want to do is we're actually skipping the vertex normals right now, <laughs> is we want to create in this array, which consists out of vector of threes and has the vertices, we want to add a vector of three. So we want to add a vertex at a specific position, which will be minus one, minus one, zero. So in a lower, well, if we look at their triangle, Basically, this one in the lower left corner. And then we want to create the other two for a triangle. Shoop, shoop. So this has the other position. This one is the one at the top. And we will also, in the indices, append the, the order. So we have number zero, the indices, for the indices, and number one, and number two. So now we have our three vertices, and we've put them in the list of indices, in the order that we want to use them. What we then want to do is we want to put these two arrays of the vertex um, vertices and indices. We want to put them. Whoops. Oh, yes. Nope. We want to put them in the, the holder for all the other arrays. So on position. If you look at this, this is position zero. The first array we want to fill with all these vertices. Then the indices we will fill with the all the indices that we've created. What we're then going to do is on the mesh of the mesh, mesh instance, which is the array mesh, we want to add a surface from arrays, which is all these arrays that we've put in here. And we want to define which type, uh, primitive type it is. If we have a look at this, there are a bunch of different primitive types. You can make a mesh consisting out of points, which for that indices are not really necessary because you're not connecting multiple vertices. You can make it out of lines and every group of two. So point one, two, this one will be a line and it will move on to the next two points and then we'll create a line between those. We have a line strip, line loop, triangles, triangle strip and triangle fan, which are a little bit um, difficult to explain right now. I think that's it. Let's just run this, shall we? Let's save it. Let's call it a cool match thing. If we run this, oh, we first need to add a camera to this. Let's move it out and let's make it current. If we then run this, you'll see that we have created a triangle. Wow. <laughs> yeah. If you want to do this in OpenGL, oh boy, you are in for a ride. 
because is there an example here? Oh yeah, you have all these buffers and uh, you need oh all of this to create a triangle. Wow. That's not even all. <laughs> you also have to create the window and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Open jail. <laughs> I'm happy that Godot exists. So, we have a triangle. What? What happened is... If we have... Might have accidentally... Let's... let's just mess with this and let's change the order around. And if we then run this, it's invisible. Because it thinks... Okay, the best way you can show the, you this is if we go into the function and in process, let's just rotate it on the Y axis by about seven times delta. Wait for it. As you can see, it's created the shape on the other side. Because if you flip it, the order is correct in clockwise order. Let's make it in Vulcan. Let's not. <laughs> oh, from what I've heard. Howdy, Ivan. Hello. From what I've heard, it is... You need, like... I don't know, a, really a lot of code to make something really basic in uh, in Vulcan. It will be really fast and amazing, but that's a lot of suffering you first have to go through. I also wouldn't make a game without a game engine. And because there is Godot, the easiest game engine, <laughs> I also wouldn't want to use anything but Godot for my personal projects. Oh, Ivan, of course, it's Bobby. Hi, Bobby. <laughs> Actually, Unity, which is a thing to keep in mind when you create meshes in Godot, you can actually just use Unity tutorials. Because <laughs> the mesh creation process between OpenGL and all the other game engines is really simpler. similar in the fact that you just have those couple of arrays filled with indices, vertices, uh, vertex normals. If you want to create a really specific shape in Godot, but you can't find a tutorial for that, just look up at your Unity, your Unity tutorial for it, because it's super easy to translate those. But yeah, if you create a triangle and you can't see it, it's probably because you got the order wrong. Let's revert that. No. Let's make this back to this. And we have our triangle again. <laughs> I'm confused. Why can we only see the triangle from one side? It is because of back face calling. For a game engine, it's so much faster to only run, run the side uh, or render the side that you will see. For example, if you build a sphere, you will only want to render the outside that the user will see and not all the insides. You can actually make it render on both sides if we go on the mesh instance and we are going to go into, where is it? Into geometry and then the material override. On that, we can create a new spatial material. And in there, we can go into flags, or where is it? Parameters. And we can see, we have a look at the cool mode. Currently set to back, so the back side will not be rendered. You can also do it the other way around, that the front side will not be rendered and the back will, or you can disable it. If we then run it, you will see, if I'm correct, that both sides will be rendered. The order determines the normal direction. Yes, basically, yeah. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we wanted, we set the uh, vertex normals in the wrong direction. It will also face the other way. But in this way, you can make both sides render. Set this to back, because this is the default for basically everything in your game engine. But as you can see, in the geometry, we have a material override, which overrides all the other materials created on your mesh. If we have a look at Suzanne, the monkey, we have a look at, whoops, monkey. At this mesh instance, we've added an OBJ file in here. And if we click on that, here, uh, yes, if we click on that, you will see if we, I close this, that it has surface, surface one. If we click on that, you will see that it has a name and a material. Within Blender, that basically corresponds to your material tab right here. It currently doesn't have a material, but it exported with one as a default. If you were to create multiple multiple materials in here, um, whoops, it will use these names, and that will correspond to this name, and the material assigned to it is this spatial material. So we can change the color and stuff. You can also go into Array Mesh, Surface Parameters, and set the cool mode. Array Mesh, Surface Parameters. Yeah, that is basically the, um, the default material it comes with. But I wanted to use the, whoops, the, um, where is it? Explain the material override. And if you have a look in here, you can add a surface from arrays. So basically a surface is one shape with a specific material. If we want to add a completely different material that has a different shininess, a different roughness, we want to create a new surface with its own arrays of vertices and indices. Have a look at the chat. Okay, so what else want to, did I want to explain? Oh, maybe the different types of primitives. I have another instance of Gido open for that somewhere over here. So this right here is a little software I put together, a piece of software that lets you draw files in 3D. And I'm using the array mesh for generating the uh, the shapes, the tiles, which are basically the just quad meshes. Whoops. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, so as you can see, it also does the back face scanning to make it easier to see. But once I, what I wanted to have a look at is how I drew the grid. The grid and those origin lines, for example, the, the white lines you see right here and the red, um, blue and green ones are also just meshes. For example, in this grid mesh, I have uh, those arrays of uh, vertices and indices. And then I have a size, grid extents, and a grid size. Um, oh yeah, grid size is the, the space between the lines. And the grid extents is how many lines there will be. Oh no, that's the distance. It will... 
divide that up. Either way, I am creating lines two by two. So um, one vertex in this position and then one vertex there. And using the primitive lines, I can just render those lines. And then one space further, or one unit further, I will create another pair of vertices at the position and it will automatically draw a line between those. I have another example. This is the intro clip I made. Recently, I've been importing Blender using the GL, GLIB format. Seems to work quite well. Do you mean GLB? Because you have GLTF and GLB. GLTF is an open source format that doesn't put the textures and stuff inside of a binary file. And GLB is like, um, it's compresses stuff and it's a lot harder to read for via code, but it puts the resources inside of the file. Yeah, I usually use GLTF as well. Oh, that's the thing we can also do. Have a look at how the OBJ file format works. You know, maybe let's, let's do that right now. We have Suzanne, if Blender doesn't crash this. Does oh, it, can I? Oh, thank you. Goodbye, Suzanne. Let's create a cube mesh and let's export it as an OBJ. Let's dump it in here. Let's call it cube.obj. And we only want to export the selection. Let's export it. And did we throw it in here? Nope. Did we throw it in here? Nope. Where did I leave it? Oh. <laughs> Where is my cube? Did I do something wrong in Blender? Let me export again. Export OBJ. This is completely the wrong folder. Good job, Lucy. Um, 3D mesh tutorial. This is the one that we want. Export. Okay, there we go. Yes, the OBJ file in all of its glory. Let's have a look at the code behind it. Okay, so that's a lot of tabs I have open. But as you can see, this is an OBJ file. First, it starts with a couple of comments and um, a hashtag is basically just the comments and it will be ignored. The MTL lib, the material library, will is the file that the material is in. You have a separate material file, which we can also open up. Shoop. We'll have a look at that in a moment. So first it starts with an O, which means it's an object, and which is cube cube dot zero one. I am not sure why it's cube cube. Cube, cube. Oh, it's basically, yeah, cube and then cube dot zero zero one. Is this, this is the object. Then we have the list of uh, vertices. An OBJ is basically just a text file describing what the vertices are. So yeah, the first vertex is at this position, minus one, minus one, one. If we then have a look inside of Blender, and if, 
if it's this one, you can press N. This is minus one, minus one, one. Is that the first one? Yes. So this is the first vertex. And then we have all the others. All one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All eight of them. Then we have the vertex texture, which is the UV coordinate. A UV coordinate is Let me have a look. What is a good example? I think this is pretty good. Okay, so Oh, I remembered it wrong. You have a U and a V. And these are coordinates on the texture. For each vertex, there is a position on a texture. And in here, we have 0.3 and then 0. So this, this one corresponds to uh, this vertex. And it is at, for the U, at 0.375, and for the V, at 0, 0. So 0, 0 on the V, and the U, uh, 0.3. So, I would say, about here, that is where the first one starts. If we then, if, can we have a look at that in Blender? Let's go to UV editing. Whoa, whoops. Let me select a face, please. Which face is it? This one. And if I'm correct, this might be the vertex we're talking about. Here, 0.375. And zero, which is this uh, UV coordinate. So yeah, these describe all these points where the texture is applied. And this is the entire texture. And we select everything. And it's fold out like that. Cool format would be easy to generate from a script or something. Yes which is what I've done over here. If you go into OBJ export, is a really simple OBJ exporter that I've made. It basically is a function that has the save function in which you throw the list of vertices, the list of vertex normals, the UV coordinate, the indices and the material that it uses. Then it will create a file. It will cr open up the file. It will add it as comments like, hey, this is made using the Lucy program. <laughs> and then it will have an empty line. And then it will print the material lib, lib uh, library comment or um, command. And it will use the name of the material that I've created inside of Godel. Then it will create an object, just called model. And then it will print out every vertex in that vertices array. One problem, or well, a thing to really look out for is in, um, in the OBJ format, is that it expects those extra zeros. If you don't, things get kind of wonky. <laughs> so what I had to do is use this um, yeah, what do you call it? It's it's a string. Um, sorry, I'm kind of getting distracted. I need more Red Bull. It is like Blue Peter. Who is Blue Peter?
Let me check how the stream is doing. 24 people still watching. Nice. Oh, we missed some comments. The... Set the monkey on fire. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not gonna set the monkey on fire. Yes, thank you, Melon. String formatting. Reformat this to have uh, six decimals. And then we're putting in the, the for vertex coordinates. So it will be printed like this with those extra zeros, which is important. Blue Beater is a kids' TV program from the UK. Ah, never heard of that. I am sorry. So what we have is a list of vertices in this file. Then we have a list of texture coordinates or vertex texture or UV coordinates. Then we have a list of vertex normals, which is the direction that these normals are facing. Use material, apparently is not using the material. Uh, smooth shading is off, it seems. Yes, I think if you turn this on, it will turn on the smooth shading. And this is kind of the difficult part. This is the, 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 the indices. And this actually seems to be working with four points instead of triangles. It creates Oh, wait, I kind of forgot how this worked. You have the order of one, one, and one. How does this work again? Oh, man. Um, I, I am not ready to explain this right now, but this is the order of the indices, like connecting uh, but I don't quite remember how this worked. Because I have been messing with that so much and there is logic behind it. But online you can, if you search for OBJ specs, no Wikipedia. This, this really retro looking page is for explaining everything about the about the Wavefront OBJ file format. All the commands that you can do, like uh, vertices, vertex texture, VP, I have no clue what VP does. But some other things that you can do is like Bezier curves, B splines, matrix things, Taylor. You can put Taylor in there. I don't know who Taylor is, but if you're interested, you can read through all of this, but there's so much. I wonder from when this page was. Because this is a while. Look, this looks like... And this is so bright. It is bright. <laughs> if you compare my webcam from this to this. <laughs> They did a lot of crafting and common catchphrase was, here's one I made earlier. I say that a lot. It's six faces, right? Each face has four vertices. Each vertex is... I am a little confused. That line makes the face and what vertex it is, what?
Sorry. Okay, so just for a recap, a vertex is a point. Yes, a point in 3 space or 2D. And a mesh is made out of vertices, where every face is made out of triangles. A vertex has a normal vector, which is the average of the adjacent faces, faces normals. That last part depends on if you're using smooth shading or not. But yes, that's about correct. Oh, Roncart is going. Goodbye. You're probably going to bed, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> yeah, it's it's late in India. Sorry, Thomas, I'm a bit like brain fried. The, the, the Red Bull is not helping. And trying to understand this while streaming is a little bit stressful, but... <laughs> Okay, so that's the OBJ file format. We're just gonna move on, I think. What else did I want to show? I'm probably going to put this link in the description, which covers all the all the basics of what I've talked about. Like the different types, the array mesh, the mesh data tool, the surface tool, immediate geometry, and when to use them. This part was a little bit confusing to me, so In summary, vertices are meshes, are points. <laughs> Is that one sentence? Uh, maybe I should have picked a topic that I am a little bit more familiar about and that I am not getting, getting lectured in the chat. Because that's quite distracting. <laughs> Let's hope this is not too loud. But... Whoops. Join me yeah, okay, so let's also have a look at redrawing the mesh every frame. Because how I did that little animation is, where do I have it? The grid is that I have put the arrays inside of the process function. So saw this stream on my dashboard, so I decided to quickly say hi before going about my night. Good luck, thank you. Um, I have put these arrays inside of the process functions, so they get recreated every single frame. What you don't want is in the other way that we've done this in the other file, whoops, is creating an outside of here. Because what will happen is that it will get filled up really quickly and your computer is not going to like that. Because every frame you're putting in those vertices and if you're a you have these arrays outside of there, they will fill up really, really quickly if you run it at 60 frames a second. So 
So what I do here is one really important thing is calling mesh.clear surfaces. So every frame you remove all the data, then you draw the mesh and you add it just like regular. So not in a process function. Cyber generation looks awesome, thank you. <laughs> so what you just want to do is put everything in a process function, then move these arrays inside of the process function so that they um, don't really fill up that quickly. And then every frame you want to clear all the surfaces so you have a clean slate to draw the mesh, then you draw the mesh. And you basically do that every frame. Yeah, that's what creates that effect. By the way, how's your Godot tutorial going? It's kind of des I'm kind of desperate because I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I'm sort of working on it, but I'm also trying to not get myself burnt out. <laughs> like I have to work on a school project and it's just so much work. I have to work from nine till five. And next to that, doing all these live streams and working on game jam stuff. Mm. And after, next to that, also making videos. It's gonna be much. Is there a resource to understand what code go what code goes into each type of build in function? Um, well, I wish if you might know, I should might know. You have the ready function, which just runs once once the node is ready, and it just, will just run once. Process will run every frame. Then you have the physics process in which you will do physics calculations, which I sometimes it's kind of confusing where to put it in a process function or physics process. But for this, you just want to make it put it in process function. I can't really give a clear answer right now to, to the difference between physics process and process, because that's a whole other story. <laughs> How do you move in and out of the process function? I meant just like changing this from from re from ready to to the process function. So you don't we even if you stop animating it, it will always redraw every frame. But yeah, what are these errors? Oh, it starts off with an empty array, which is not really what you want, but... Physics process runs at the f uh, steady frame rate. Yes, it will also, for physics calculations, it needs to be run at 60 frames a second. Thank you for making this tutorial. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm just worried. I mean, you're welcome. Like, I try my best, but I'm so tired. <laughs> The Red Bull is not helping. Red Bull is gone. Okay, I think I kind of showed everything that I want to show. Maybe it's also good to have a look at how you can add colliders for these objects. So what I have done in this project Mm -hmm. So if this question already came up, I just joined. Isn't it really inefficient to redraw the vertices every frame, or is it just standard in Godot? Mm -hmm. It depends on what you want to do. If you just want to redraw every, if you want to animate the object, then you will want to redraw every all the vertices every frame. But if you're 
just going to make a static mesh that is not going to change, you will want to just draw it in the ready function like this. Uh, I want vacation and no more Red Bull. Mm -hmm. What was I talking about? Mesh colliders, yes, mesh, co mesh colliders, which I have in this project. I have, let me see. Collision shape, which is empty. Uh, I think this, if I remember, remember correctly, this is what generates the mesh. And, okay, we have, well, the vertices, tangents, normal indices, and then somewhere we also Oh wow, that's all. <laughs> so we have a collision shape, which is this node, which is currently empty. It doesn't have a collision shape. But what we want to change the shape to mesh does create a tri mesh shape. We're just going to let Godot like, hey, uh, create a triangle mesh for me, please. And Godot will do that. So should we try that out? Do we have, let's change back the curling mode. Of, what shall we do? Okay, let's create a mesh instance and let's create a static body. We'll drag that. Whoops, we'll drag the mesh under the static body and we will have a collision shape. We create a big plane shape. And then mesh instance will also create a plane. Scale that up. Okay, now this plane has collision. Or why is it complaining? <laughs> plane shapes don't work well and will be removed in future versions. Please don't use them. Then <laughs> Okay, let's use a box shape then and increase this and increase that. Let's move up the camera. Let's also add a directional light because who doesn't want a little bit of light in their lives? Swoop. Let's enable shadow. Okay, now we have a basic setup of have with a static body with a collision shape. And we have our mesh instance that we generate during runtime. Let's add a... Okay, no, wait, let's add a rigid body. And to that, we will add our mesh. And we will also add a collision shape. So what we are going to do is add a variable. Which is on red D. And which is the collision shape. And we will want to get, what do we want to get? Get node. And we will want to go one up to the rigid body, and then we want to use the collision shape. Did I write them correctly? Yes, I did, I think. Okay, now we have the collision shape. Down here, we will want to go on the collision shape dot shape. And we will just want to use the mesh that we've just created. And we will just yell it to 
create dry mesh shape. So we just yell at the mesh, create this for me, or while well, yell at Godot for to create uh, dry mesh. And we will put that in the collision shape. If everything is all right, let's change the color of our little triangle to bright red. If we then run this, where did our triangle go? You know what? If we just connect the camera to our little guy, it keeps falling really quickly. Maybe let's come this out. Oh, wait. I think we might need to move this down a little. Yep. <laughs> oh, wow. Did it basically just land on its side and perfectly balance its itself? Plane shapes don't work well and it will be removed in future versions. Please don't use them. Could be a good meme. Not one of the best, but it's something. Yeah. Oh man, when working with Unity, so much stuff gets deprecated. Then you would just want to use a library and it says this will be deprecated. This, this is deprecated. It's like, oh, just so much. Let's rotate our widget body a little bit. Whoops. It still doesn't fall over. How does that happen? Huh? Everyone use plain shapes exclusively, so they have to keep supporting them. Ooh. <laughs> Okay, so we have created a rigid body, a custom mesh, and then we have created a custom triangle mesh for it. Whew, okay. Is there anything else that you folks want to see? And really quickly check how many people are watching. Like 19 people still? Wow. I would expect that triangle to fall over. Yes, I don't get why the triangle is not falling over. I angled it a little bit. But it doesn't. If I just angle it like this, does it fall over? It doesn't. How does that work? Wait, let me move the camera over real quick. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Those hands fall over. Can we see three collision shapes? If we go into debug, visible collision shapes, and then run it again. Yes, it seems to be that it just created a triangle, but maybe it doesn't have any weights to it. This is magic. <laughs> You must have balanced it perfectly in the universe. But it's at an angle. Why? <laughs> I don't know why this happens, but whatever. When you make the mesh array script a tool, can you... Oh, a tool script. I am very curious about that. This is Michael Jackson Smith Grimm on the lean, yup. Thanks for showing us so much cool stuff. Yay. You want to move a point and reform the mesh. To rain shaping in a game, you would return.
If you have a terrain and you want to move it. Oh, Thomas, were you the person that had the question about creating terrain with um, overlapping? Where can a game where you shape the terrain? Well, there are two different ways of creating terrain and shaping it. If you're using height maps, then it won't be able to have overlapping geometry. But... You've probably already seen this, but... If we have a look at this... Um, this is like the perfect add-on for voxel terrain, which is basically 3D... Uh, uh, yeah, how do you call that? Well, it's, it's voxels, but then rounded off with algorithms and stuff. And this is just a free add-on you can use. Which is nice for shaping through terrain. Oh, that's also cool for using 3D Perlin noise or just noise. For terrain from, yeah, the voxel module. Yeah, this one. Sorry, it's just, it looks so cool. A bunch of sine waves. Okay, before I get too distracted, but this looks so cool. I have seen that, but way beyond me using it at this point, lol. Oh. <laughs> if you want to move a point and reform the mesh, like terrain shaping in the game, would you just rerun the code each time you move a point? Yeah. What you can do is divide the shape up or the terrain into multiple chunks. That's how Minecraft does it. Have small points that or small chunks and only update that part. And if it's next to, well, that's more voxel like. Uh, it's a bit harder. I need to do more research. Yeah. And I'm also not sure how you mean changing the terrain, but. Yeah, another, I have a bunch of tabs open that I want to show you. This is a cool tutorial that Matt, I don't know if Matt's still in the chat, that rhymes. But he used this for a game that is a Unity tutorial, which describes how you can create a mesh that has a certain width, width, uh, <laughs> These notes are amazing. But you basically run it and then divide, or well, subdivide this. And you create a subdivided plane. But what you can do with that is... Like we did, like rebuild it every frame to animate it. Yeah, 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 create waves. <laughs> this person uses multiple waves through moving through each other. So that is creates a more chaotic wave like uh, formation. And he has like four tutorials. Next one, he creates the ocean shader and in this one, he creates the buoyancy effect. So that you can still move, you can still move on top of the generated mesh. Which is so, just so cool. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you could just use these, uh, these Unity tutorials and then translate them to Godot, which is quite easy. Help, how do, you, do I set up custom textures in Trench Broom? Melon, you gotta wait for the Trench Broom tutorial. I can also tell you in person, but this is not really a Trench Broom 
mm, live stream. It's more focused on just mesh generation. <laughs> I haven't heard of this creator. I'll have a check them out. You mean this person? Or this add on? Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's Unity. You can see by the super ugly gray colors. Don't get me wrong, I don't hate Unity, but I hate those colors. And I am so happy that you can use, just use dark mo dark theme in the new versions for free, which is not a feature you would want to pay so much money for. So yeah, you can change and uh, create a mesh that is just ever changing, and just redraw it every frame, or divide it up into chunks to save on performance. This is also a very cool website from a really cool Godot creator and I think also a contributor to the Godot project. He works on um, really advanced... Oh, I was just looking at the scene preview. <laughs> mm. But this person created a bunch of 3D modeling tools or for Godot, the inverse kinematics, and this person also created tutorials, Godot tutorials, a bunch of cool 3D mesh generation tutorials, but then using the surface tool, including a tutorial on how you can make a little Minecraft game. Unity hate stream. No, no, we're not going to do that. This person talks about the voxels and creating the mesh for it. It provides all the code for free. Um, talks about creating like the north, east, south, south, top and bottom parts of... Oh, there's so much code. But it's fun to mess around with. Because in Minecraft, you basically only re render the top half of the or the faces that you can see, and you, you're not going to render every single cube. This tutorial is what got me started with creating meshes inside of Godot. I am going to put that in the description right now. If I can do that... Can I do that while streaming? Surface to tutorial. I could also just paste the link in chat, but this is for later. And save. I think that's saved then. And the tutorials should be in the description right now. Not sure if we can see the difference right here with the... Oh yes, this person also goes over the basics of what are vertices, what are indices. This person talks about indices as uh, the connections, which is kind of true, I guess. But I will more say that the, the indices are the points that connect them together. Um... Actually, let's compare. Oh, my theme. No, thank you. Uh, I don't know. Whoops. Basically, this is the same code as we did for the array mesh as the surface tool. Because the only difference mainly is that you first, in the ready function, you create a variable that is the surface tool, a new, a new instance of a surface tool. Then on that surface tool, we say, say uh, begin. Then in there, we tell it what type of uh, primitive we want. We want to use triangles. And then you add the normal. You can add an extra color per vertex. 
and you can add the vertex. You add a vertex, one, two, three, and then you add the indices, and then you say surface tool dot commit, and it creates the mesh. You don't have to mess mess with all those arrays and that array with the multiple arrays. As you can see, this is just quicker and easier to use. But because you've watched the array mesh part, you will also just understand this because this is just a simpler version of of the array mesh. Yeah, but yeah, this is a slightly slower version way of doing things, but via code, just the code, writing the code is quicker because it's just easier. It's more geared to, well, it looks more like OpenGL, I think OpenGL 2. Right now you have mostly have OpenGL. No, wait, this is more like OpenGL 1. It doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to go into that, but there are completely different ways in OpenGL 1. You can describe it really easily and I lost it in a way like this and in OpenGL later versions of OpenGL it's just better to do it in a more um, array mesh like structure. Okay. Just gonna put this here, not sure why I couldn't see your link. You mean the link to this website? I've put that in the description. I could also post it in chat, I think. Flip the flop. There we go. Rolao, how long have I been streaming? 98 minutes. 98, how much is that? I'm actually kind of tired. So is there anything else that you guys want to see? I wonder how many people are still there. This stream didn't go as well as the last one. Cause that one, there were just so many people and it was a lot of fun, but there's still 12 people watching. It's like everybody left. Maybe it's because I picked a too technical topic. And with the last, the last tutorial, it was a much more creative focused tutorial slash live stream thing. Oh, Matt is still there. Hello. I was mostly confused today. Want to see you get some rest. <laughs> huh. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> well, that's a good question. How is the performance manipulating the vertices in real time versus with shaders? I'm actually not sure. I would think that running, to, running it on the GPU and manipulating a shape via uh, ver uh, vertex shaders would be more performant, but I'm not sure if you can still uh, manipulate the collision shape via that. Also, can the performance be improved by creating a C++ module which builds on the mesh on the mesh tool? Um, it's not really a module. I think if you just create a C++ class instead of a GD script, if you just do the same as this, but within a C++ script, it should be like four times faster. The only thing that isn't nice about shaders thing is that it only does does the looks. And so yeah, no collision. Yeah, you're right, Matt, probably. Would be interesting to see how to 
force OBJ files to integrate them directly into dynamic meshes. If you, um, is this the example with Suzanne? Where are you, Suzanne? I was thinking about creating a module GD extent. Oh, oh, sorry. I thought C sharp. You said C sharp. You said C plus plus. I, I'm sorry. Then it is a module. I was thinking about creating a module slash GD extension for creating real time fluid simulation. That would be cool. That would be really cool. <laughs> And that needs high performance, yes, then probably C++ is the way to go. Because that is just the fastest. Maybe also Rust. You also have Rust bindings for Godot. Which is basically just C++, but different syntax, I think. But it's about integrating um, an OBJ as an array mesh. If you just import an OBJ and put it inside of your mesh instance, it already is an array mesh. So you can do with it what you want. And I think with the mesh data tool, you can just grab everything. Wait, no, maybe even now you can just grab all the all the vertices from this array mesh, from the monkey, and put them in your own uh, arrays. So you don't really need to parse an OBJ, I think. Don't you need some rust? <laughs> yeah, maybe I should. GD extension extension still breaks for me a lot. Usable, so it's not usable to experiment yet. Oh, GD extension is the new version of GD native, right? <laughs> I hope so. Gido 4.0 will cause some world peace. <laughs> you know, maybe it's getting time to end the stream. Because there are so many people that are leaving. <laughs> and I think I've said what I wanted to say. Yes, and you don't need to compile the engine again. Oh, yes, that sounds so much better. I haven't messed with C++ in the uh, GD native yet, but... Sounds really tiring to just have to compile the entire engine again. We'll go to API. It sounds powerful, but... Yeah. So... I think I am going to end it here. And Flame Lizard, thank you for your cool insights and the things you're working on. Thanks for people for, for joining. I I'm going to take a rest and <laughs> I will probably be back on Twitch somewhere soon. I have to work on school projects and then I will be on um, live streaming on Twitch probably once a week if I have the energy for that but I have to work on stuff anyways for school so yep see you then hopefully so see you on Twitch <laughs> yay okay then goodbye oh thank you all oh there's a <laughs> Okay, goodbye. Where's the end button? <laughs>